I just hope they'll let me work the product table when they go on tour, don't you? Man, that was good. That blessed my heart. If we had Vestal in the corner waving a flag, we'd have had something, wouldn't we? <laughs> For those of you who don't know that reference, God bless you, you'll learn in heaven. All right, so if you'll take your Bibles out and turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, I want to be very clear with you. We are working our way through the book of Genesis. We find ourselves in chapter 12. We'll have a little bit of tie into Palm Sunday, but I want to make sure I'm clear with you. Next Sunday is Easter. Uh, and if you look in your Bible, the very next part of the book of Genesis next Sunday would be Abraham and Lot and their decision to separate and all that kind of stuff. And, well, that just ain't an Easter sermon, all right? Uh, and so next Sunday we'll be in the New Testament looking at the day of the Lord. And so I want you to be sure when you invite a friend, they're going to hear much of Jesus and the gospel and the good news of Easter. But for today, we will continue our journey through Genesis. So in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 is where we'll be today. But today is Palm Sunday. It is the, the, the day in which the, for out, throughout the centuries, Christians have remembered, retold, celebrated, drawn near to the Lord, proclaimed to others why this Holy Week is so important to us. It commemorates, it remembers that week in which Jesus gave his life. He rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we refer to it as Palm Sunday because if you were to read your Bible in, in, in the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that as he rode into Jerusalem, that the, the crowd began to lay down palm branches and their cloaks, and they were coronating a king. They were celebrating that they thought a king was coming to overthrow Caesar, to overthrow Herod, to overthrow Rome, and so they were coronating a king. And in that coronation service... They were shouting Hosanna and Savior, and, and they're excited about it. But if you were to read the Gospel of Mark particularly, and they're in the accounts of the other Gospels, but you'll find that story in chapter 10 of the crowd shouting Hosanna. But if you follow the Gospel of Mark over to chapter 15, you'll find much of that same crowd yelling, crucify him. What a fickle crowd. In less than five days, the majority, the masses, and I'm not speaking about his followers that were his disciples, but the majority, the masses, those that had peered into Jesus' life, they may have been there when he fed the 5,000, they may have been there when he made the man's hand grow back or the lame man to walk, they may have been there when he pulled the coin out of the mouth of the fish in order to pay the, the tax at the temple, they may have seen those things. They may have seen the resurrection of Lazarus, and on Sunday, they yelled, Hosanna. But when the crowd got into it, when the Romans began to threaten, when pressure began to build, they would yell, crucify him. What a fickle crowd. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself, because I like to think this way too, not me, not me. Boy, if I was in the crowd that day, I would have yelled Hosanna, and on the day they crucified him, I would have tried to stop the soldier. I love Jesus, not me. Well, let me give that to you in Hebrew, baloney. We are fickle people. Our hearts are torn. We will, on Sunday, worship the Lord with our hands raised high, tears down our face, snot bubbles in our nose. We will praise the Lord. And on Monday, we will use words we forgot the Lord told us not to use. One day, we will be excited about the Lord, and the next, we'll have lockjaw when we get ready to share the gospel with someone. We are fickle people. In fact, the reason why we know this is because the gospel is so good, and we don't live up to the joy of the gospel, so we're frustrated in our own faith. Think for a moment about the good news of the gospel. That God in his mercy saw us in our sin and sent his one and only son to come and die in our place, to be buried in our tomb, to raise from the grave and declare to us that if we believe in him, we trust him, we know that he is God in the flesh who died for us, we can have our sins forgiven, our relationship with God redeemed, our eternity secure. We are now filled with the spirit of the living God. Heaven is our home. God is our father. Sin is our past. Satan has been defeated. Isn't the gospel good? And even when I say all that, tomorrow I will act like a fool. 
because my heart is fickle. My flesh is wobbly. My faith struggles. And so this morning, what I hope to do by looking at one of the unfolding stories of the life of Abram, which would become Abraham that we began last week, I, I hope to show you that even when your faith is faulty, even when your faith is wobbly, even when you're not living with the zeal that you once or you're in a season where you're struggling, I hope you will see today in the story of God dealing with Abraham that regardless of your faith, God is faithful. That the, the promises of salvation and the promises of God are not changed because we are fickle. He knows that we are a people who are frail and fallen and struggle. Let me show you what I mean. Look with me at Genesis chapter 12 beginning in verse 10. Genesis chapter 12 beginning in verse 10. We'll read through the first two verses of chapter 13. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter into Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know you are a woman of beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the prince of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her. Princes, excuse me, of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abraham. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male servants and female servants and female donkeys and camels, all given to Abraham. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with the great plagues because Sarah was Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt, and he and his wife, and they had, they had with him and lot with him to Negev. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and in gold. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we ask you to help us now as we uh, read this true story, this real account uh, of Abraham and his wife and Pharaoh and this foolishness of his fallen faith. And Lord, as we read this story, there are so many cultural gaps from us to this time frame. There are so many things here that are appalling to us that we don't understand and so help us to see the eternal truths of your word uh, lord help us to to see you as good and high and lifted up and lord more than anything help us to see that when our faith is faulty you are always faithful i believe father that there is no way that we could gather in a room this size and there not be people who are walking through hard days, tough times, heavy news, struggles, moments of testing of their faith. Lord, I pray you'd remind them today, you are faithful. Bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you recall with me the story of Abram and his calling, and you were to look back at chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, and the Lord said to Abram, so Abram is with his family. We looked at this last week. He's with his family. He's doing okay. And God shows up out of nowhere into Abram's life and says, Abram, I'm calling you to leave your home, leave your family, leave everything you have. You can read this in the first three verses. We'll look at them in a little while. And I want you to go. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you all the generations, the numbers of the stars and the grain on the sand. And I want you to go. Trust me. And the Bible says there, if you look in verse 1, it says, and the Lord said, and then if you look in verse 4, it says, Abraham went. What faith? We looked at this last week. He obeyed the Lord. The Lord said, go, and Abram went. He did exactly what faith calls us to do. Listen to the Lord, obey the Lord. So he started walking. So the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 12 show us a man who is giant in his faith. 
I mean, he leaves, he travels some 500 miles across to get to Canaan. He travels through Canaan. He worships God in Canaan. And he's, and he's so overwhelmed with what God is going to do that he has faith in the Lord. And then we get to chapter, verse 10, and a famine shows up, and he decides to give his wife away. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I think if I were to make some corny dad joke here, he goes from hero to zero real quick, doesn't he? Like, like, wait a minute, what happened? I thought you were the guy that God said, go, and you went, and you're the guy who worshiped, and God spoke with you and promised you stuff, and, and you're all this man of faith, and then all of a sudden you cross over into Egypt and you start giving away your wife. What is wrong with you? Well, there are a couple of reasons why I'm glad this story's in the Bible. I'm glad this story's in the Bible because, one, it will show us that God uses broken people. That God uses faulty people. As the old preacher would say, God takes crooked sticks and straightens them out. He knows what to do with them, right? He knows how to use broken vessels. Abraham is not perfect. He's not the Savior. He is full of flaws, and we will see that through the rest of Genesis. We also, I'm thankful that this story is in the Bible, because God tells us the truth. He doesn't sugarcoat his people. He doesn't somehow let us believe that Abraham is this super guy and everything's good in his family. He, he shows us that real people that follow him have real problems and real crisis of faith. And we need to hear that because we need to re be reminded that our faith can be challenged, our knees can wobble, and the Lord still loves us. And so this morning, I hope to look at this story of Abram and give you three truths three challenges, three ideas that will help you when you find your faith faltering. What do you do to keep from becoming a zero like Abram has done in this story? So truth number one, I think our faith falters when we forget the presence of God. When we forget that God is with us. When we forget that he walks with his People. Look with me at the text. Let us dive into it together. Beginning in verse 13, let's look at the first couple of verses again. Now there was a famine in the land. Now this is the impetus for the struggle. This is the start of the problem. This is where the faith crisis hits a wall. Now Abram was living in Mesopotamia with his family before he was called out. He was in a fertile place. They were an established family, which means they had their irrigation down. They had their gardens down. They had their vineyards going. It was a place where he knew that year after year, whether the seasons were good or bad, they were going to have some livestock to eat. They were going to have uh, some food from the vine to take in. Like they, they were okay. They had managed society. Then he ups and leaves and travels to Canaan where he is not established. He doesn't have a farm. He doesn't have irrigation. He doesn't have a plan. And if you know anything about Israel, the land of Israel, they call it the living desert. And the reason why they call it the living desert is because it is a desolate place, but when it gets water, it flourishes, it grows. And so what uh, Israel has done, and even in modern days, they have worked out, as we do here, irrigation. They have worked out the way to bring water when the rains don't come. But when there is a dry season in Israel in the time of Abram, and you don't have a good system, you're going to starve. And Abraham's in charge of his wife, Lot, his nephew, all of his servants, all of his cattle. That's a lot of pressure to put on him that are hungry and starving. So the famine becomes the crisis of his faith. What am I going to do in this famine? What am I going to do to meet this challenge? What am I going to do? How am I going to trust the Lord? Now, I don't want to sermonize this too far, but maybe there are some of you here this morning that find yourself in a spiritual famine. You are facing a challenge. You are facing a spiritual battle. You are facing a struggle. You are facing a moment where your faith is being twisted and turned and put in the pressure cooker, if you will. What are you going to do? How are you going to make sure that you stay without wavering in this moment? Well, let me just say this. Abram does it all wrong, all right? He doesn't follow the right plan. Now, the Bible says that he goes down to Egypt. Now, inherently, this is not sinful. God does not seem to condemn him for going into Egypt. In fact, we will read later in the book of Genesis that God's people will find Egypt as a rescuer of food later on in their life. So Egypt, because of the Nile River and the flood basin, has a very fertile soil even in dry seasons. So it's a good place to find food. 
So he's going down to Egypt in order to save his family. He's making a decision. And we have no evidence in Scripture that going down to Egypt was somehow sinful for him. We don't want to sermonize that. We don't want to say, well, he should have stayed where God told him to stay. We, we don't see that. That's not why he's rebuked in the story. But he goes down to Egypt. He goes down there. But he's worried about something. Now look at verse 11. It says in verse 11, um, it says, um, when he was about to enter Egypt. All right, so he's getting to the property line of the country of Egypt, the nation of Egypt. And he says, uh, he says to his wife, Sarah, I know you are a woman of beautiful in appearance. Now, he's off to a good start, isn't he? Sarah, you're so pretty. I'm so thankful you're my wife. Thank you for making this journey with me. You are radiant and glowing. You are so good looking to my eyes. If he'd have stopped there, we might have had something. But he didn't stop there. Notice the very next thing that he says. Verse 12. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, that it may go well for me. Now, there is a lot of stuff here we don't understand. Some say that Abraham thought that if he could convince them that Sarah was his sister, that he would be viewed as the protector of her, as a big brother, maybe mom and dad have died kind of deal, and that he could fend off any suitors who were coming to pay a bride price and that he could keep himself and her alive. Now, that's the noble answer. We don't know if that's true or not, but that's making Abraham look a little better. Now, when I read the story, he tried to give his wife away. So I don't know if I'd go down that road too far, all right? But we just don't understand this culture and this idea. We do understand that she was beautiful in some marked way. Now, commentaries have scratched their head on what makes her so beautiful. We must make sure that we do not apply the American standard of what we've been told beautiful is. We've been told beautiful is whatever's on the cover of whatever nasty magazine that's being sold out there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. But we are told that beauty is somehow found in youth and found in youngness. Now, I must remind you that Sarah is 65 at this moment. Now, she doesn't have her first child to 90, so, so maybe in that world she's somewhat young. One commentator said she's beautiful because she hadn't had children yet. <laughs> I said, bro, I wouldn't have wrote that or printed it in a book, man. What are you doing? Uh, that commentator is single, by the way. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but we, we don't know. Some say that, that her beauty came because she is the, the, patri the monarch of the patriarch of God, that God has blessed Abram in a special way and has caused her to have a glow about her. Uh, some say her beauty is because she's simply a Proverbs 31 woman. She's in charge of this whole nation that's traveling around with Abraham, and she works hard, and she does what she's supposed to do, and she's going. Whatever the case may be, in the eyes of Abram and in the eyes of the Egyptians, she had a marked beauty about her, and they noticed. Abraham was right. They noticed. The Bible says there that the Egyptians saw her and praised her. So the plan's working. Hey, I told you they were going to say you were beautiful. Now, I should add one note here, uh, husbands. This is why English and Hebrew are sometimes not uh, interchangeable in our language. The Hebrew word here is the same word used in Genesis chapter 41 when speaking of a cow saying it's a fine specimen. So, so when you call your wife beautiful, don't say you're beautiful like Genesis chapter 12, okay? Don't, don't say that. Uh, but they, they, they had, the plan's working. And then you'll notice in there what happens. Notice there 12 verse, verse 12 and 13. And they praised it to Pharaoh... And Pharaoh took her into his possession. She becomes a bride in his harem. She becomes one of his collection. Now, he treated Abraham well. Notice what he did. He brought Abraham all kind of stuff. He said, here's some servants and some donkeys. He even brought camels. And at this time in history, camels were not prolific in this area yet. So camels were a sign of luxury and riches. And so Abraham now has this whole gift. Why would Abraham get those gifts from Pharaoh? Because he's told everybody this is his sister. He's getting a bride price for his sister. So now just imagine with me. Abraham is watching his wife be carried off by the Egyptian soldiers. He's holding these really expensive camels. And he's going, what have I done? It's like an unraveling episode of I Love Lucy, isn't it? Like, what have I done? I made these plans. I thought they were going to work. And boy, have they backfired. Boy, have they unraveled in front of me. Now, I want you to notice something that happens here that I think is interesting. Notice with me verse 11. I think this is the part where we can make the application. Because I'll be honest with you, most of the text as it reads is not applicable to us. 
I don't expect any of you are going to claim that your spouse is your brother or sister. I don't expect any of you to be fearful of the Pharaoh of Egypt taking one of you. And I certainly don't expect camels to be delivered to your front yard. But I want you to see what I think is applicable to us. Look at verse 11. He says in verse 11, when he was about to enter Egypt. I find that striking. That Abraham, up until now, heard God over here in Mesopotamia. God said, go to a land I will show you. He didn't even give him directions. Start walking. And he trusted God enough to start walking. He walked all the way across the desert. He walked all the way to the northern end of Canaan. He walked all the way through the land of Canaan that was already occupied by the Canaanites. Those were not his people. He walked all the way through that land. All along the way, he felt the presence of the Lord. In fact, look in your Bibles with me for just a moment at chapter 12. Go back up with me to verse 7. While he's in the land of Canaan, Abraham actually worships God. In verse 7, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offsprings I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, now skip down uh, to verse uh, 8, or, or, or yeah, verse 8. And there he moved to the hill country on the east, to Bethel, and he pitched his tent in Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And now notice this. And there he built an altar of the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. He worshiped the Lord all along the way and somehow, don't miss this now, somehow when he saw the boundary line of Egypt, he assumed God wasn't going with him. Now how foolish is this? How foolish is it for him to think that when he reached a testing point of a famine in his faith or he reached a location of Egypt that somehow the famine or the boundary line of Egypt was such a formidable foe that God would be limited with him. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not the story of our heart. We will wake up one day, calamity will come, crisis will fall, the phone will ring, the news will not be good. We will wake up one day and the vices of this world have squeezed us and squeezed us and squeezed us and squeezed us. And somewhere deep down, we may not articulate it, but we will behave in a manner as if we think God has left us. We will behave in a manner as we will think, I am facing this problem, this situation, this crisis of my faith, and I better figure it out on my own because God is not here. How foolish are we to think? You see, our faith wobbles when we don't wake each morning and remember while we were sleeping, God was holding all things together. And when we wake, he meets us in the morning because he's the God who's always with us. Abram forgot the presence of the Lord. I find it interesting that as he stared at Egypt, he was scared but he forgot to stare at the stars over Egypt that God had made. I find it interesting that as he crossed into the land of Egypt over the raging rivers that he would once find food from, he forgot the God who carved those rivers. I find it interesting that he worshipped God in Canaan and assumed God couldn't be in Egypt. Brothers and sisters, hear me now. Wherever you find yourself, whatever famine you may be in, Whatever place you may have gotten to, whatever challenge or struggle or uncertainty may be the path in front of you. I know this for sure. God is with you. God is there. God will never leave you or forsake you. This is the promise of a loving God who is with his people. He says, Abraham, where are you think where do you think I went? Why do you think I'm not with you? And because he didn't see the presence of God, because he didn't understand the presence of God, because he felt God had forsaken him, he began to do it in his own power and make schemes in himself. And those plans certainly began to fall apart as fast as Papa Fool. Just think for a moment some of the scriptures that we learned as children. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me me. Think about it. The Lord's with us. He's always with his children. In Isaiah, it says, fear not, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm with you. If God is for us, who can be against us? How foolish Abram was to look at Egypt and think somehow he had to scheme to save his life because God was with him. Moses would tell Joshua in the book of Deuteronomy, 
In chapter 31, verse 8, when they were getting ready to go into the promised land, he would give them the courage. He would say, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. The Lord is with his people. I like the way David writes it in Psalms 139. David is flabbergasted. He is blown away with the idea that God is everywhere at all times. He literally asks in poetry form, where shall I go from your spirit? Which location can I get away from you? Where can I not find you is the question that he asks. Notice how he answers the question. Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, you are there. If I take my wings on the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea. If I get up and go to the furthest corner of the globe. For those of you who are unaware, the world is not flat. The furthest corner of the globe, at the earliest part of the morning, there may not be anybody else there, but you know who's already there? The psalmist says, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. Your hand shall lead me. Your hand will hold me. Listen to me. When you walk tomorrow into that doctor's appointment and the news changes your life, the Lord is already there. When you sit by the bed of your dying family member and you hold their hand and you find the grief is so unbearable and you don't understand why God didn't do it this way or that way or this way, listen to me now. I will not leave you or forsake you. God is there. When you find yourself walking into a place of work that's hostile to your beliefs in a country that seems to be turning from the very gospel it was founded on, let's remember one thing. God may not be in the politician, he may not be in the polling, he may not be in the news, but he has not left his people. God is with us. Craig Rochelle, pastor and evangelist, would write it this way. He would say, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. The famine may be bad, Egypt may be scary, but God is there. Our faith wobbles when we forget his presence. Number two, I think we can learn from this story that our faith falters when we forget his power. Look how the story unfolds. Uh, In my reading of the story, Pharaoh's kind of treated unfairly. Uh, He's kind of not handled uh, well if you you think about it, but then you start to see that God's up to something. God's doing something. So notice with me what happens. Look how it unfolds. Look where it goes. He says uh, in verse 14, When Abram entered Egypt, uh, or excuse me, yeah, when Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that uh, that the woman was beautiful. And when the prince of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he sent sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male servants and female servants and female donkeys and camels. Now look at verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh. This is sudden onset disease. Some sort of plague. Most likely, you see the pattern in Scripture, most likely some sort of skin disease. Maybe boils or leprosy or something hit him quickly. And all of his house became with this plague. Now, we will see this happen again in Scripture. Pharaoh down the road will be cursed with plagues. Pharaoh down the road will have to make a decision if he'll let God's people go or not. This is a foreshadowing of what God will do with with, uh, Moses and, and Joseph's descendants in Egypt. But we see it here with Abram. He says, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because Sarah was Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that this was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. We would say it this way, get out. Now verse 20, and Pharaoh gave them orders concerning the men and they sent him away it's not only does he say get out he says you walk them to the boundary line you make sure you're waving at them as they go out of Egypt now this is a fickle story it is different to our ears we don't quite understand what's happening we don't know what's going on just imagine with me again Abraham he comes up with this scheme because he's afraid that somehow God's not going to be with him and so he thinks he has to figure it out on his own so he comes up with this scheme with Sarah Sarah pretend you're my wife now before you think well Sarah wasn't involved she went along with it she did we don't we don't know all that we're not placing blame on either one but we're just saying they came up with a really dumb idea and they decided to play out this idea and it fell in their lap because they didn't trust in the presence of the Lord 
And so Pharaoh shows up, and Abraham has no way to say no to Pharaoh. He has no way to say, wait, I was lying, that's my wife. He's scared for his life. He's scared that he lied to the, to the king of Egypt. And so what does he do? He loses his family, loses his wife. She goes away. I can just see him holding those camels, weeping, going, what am I going to do now? God told me I was going to be the father of a great nation. I was going to have a land, and now I've lost the wife that's going to give me the children to father the nation. I am in trouble. And then can you imagine? Pharaoh looking up and all those Egyptians have swung around and begun to come back. That all of a sudden, after however long, we don't know how long it took, we don't know how long Sarah was in his presence, but, but at some point he is afflicted and he begins to trace his steps of when did this disease start and he pinpoints it to the moment that he brought Sarah into his house. And somewhere in his investigation, he figures out what's going on because he shows back up and you can see it there in verse 14, 15, 16. Notice the questions that he asks. What have you done? Why did you do this to me? What's going on? Something's happening. Get this woman, right? So whatever is happening, take, take this away. And so God shows up with his power. Now, what's interesting about this is that I imagine that Abram immediately understands that God's behind this. I mean, there's nobody else that can be behind it. Abram didn't do it. Lot couldn't have done it. There's no soldiers or armies that's freeing his wife. When Pharaoh shows up and all of his uh, court, all of his house, and they've got this plague, they've got this visible problem. When they show up and he says, what have you done to me? Why is my skin falling apart? Why is this plague on my home? Take her. Why did you lie to me? Why did you want me to commit adultery? I didn't want anything to do with this. What are you doing? Take this woman away from me. So you got to understand that at that moment, Abraham is hit in the face with the power of God. You might say to yourself, well, he didn't understand God's power. Now wait just a moment. Abraham is the great-grandson of Noah. I imagine all of his life sitting at the dinner table, the story of his great-granddaddy saving the world through a boat because God flooded the earth probably came up a time or two. It probably was discussed. Abraham would have been alive during chapter 11 when God crushes the town that would be called Babylon, the Tower of Babel, and scatters the people in their languages. Abraham is very familiar with the power of God. Unfortunately, he had amnesia. He forgot. He saw the famine. He saw Egypt. And he somehow thought God would not be able to handle this problem. He somehow thought that God would not be more powerful than the Pharaoh. That God would not be more powerful than the soldiers. That God would not be able to handle this situation. He completely forgot the power of God. So he began to trust in himself. Paul Washer, the great pastor, says it this way. He says, the more you trust in the arm of flesh, the less you're going to see of the power of God. He trusted his own arm, and he didn't see God move. He didn't trust God to move. He trusted his own power. What a mess we get in when we decide that we will work out whatever schemes in our own way, our own plans, and we will go about it in our own power. Abraham did not trust the Lord. He should have heard the words of Jeremiah. He should have heard the prophet. Ah, Lord God is with you. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Sarah should have looked at him. Abraham should have stopped. Lot should have screamed. And they should have went outside of their tent before they crossed into Egypt, looked up at the stars, looked up at the mountains, looked up at the sun and said, wait a minute. Why are we afraid of the Egyptians? Our God, there is nothing too hard for him. Wait a minute. Is he not the God that put the well in the ocean? Is he not the God that put the stars in the sky? Is he not the God that carved the boundaries of the seas? Is he not the God that flooded it, saved it, and rebuilt it through the life of my great-granddaddy Noah? Is this not the same God? Why am I afraid? Why am I shaking? Why am I so scared? Oh, he forgot the power of God. Brothers and sisters, as we make our way into Holy Week, might I submit to you that every single part of the Bible is true and every single part of the Bible is resting on one powerful act of God. And that one powerful act is that his one and only son came and died and was buried and laid cold, dead in a tomb for three days. And then God the Father told the angels, go get 
him up. And he rose from the grave, defeating death, hell, and Satan, ripping the curtain, raising the dead. If my God can bring his son from the dead and he be alive for all eternity, don't you think my God can be in the doctor's office with you? Don't you think my God can be in the funeral home while you're weeping? Don't you think my God can be in the marriage counseling room resurrecting what once looked hard and broken? Don't you think my God can be with you at your job when you walk boldly for Christ and no one else does? He forgot the power of God and God reminded him through Pharaoh. Isn't it interesting that there is almost kind of an irony that Pharaoh believed more in God than Abram did at this moment? I don't know what you've done and I don't know what your God's up to, but I see the evidence. Get this woman away from me. He forgot the power of God. Number three, and we'll close with this one. I believe our faith falters when we forget the promises of God. Look with me what happens as the story ends, so you'll see it. It says there in uh, chapter 13, So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and they had with him Lot, and they went into Negev, and now verse 2. Now Abram was a very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Now if you read this story, you, you, you might be tempted to say, well, okay, so pastor, what you're telling me is, I can make a really, really bad mess of everything, and God's going to fill up my bank account. That's not the lesson of the story. The lesson of the story is, take your Bibles and look at chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Listen, listen to what it says in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the calling of Abraham. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred, and your father's house and the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and, I will and those who dishonor you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. You see, Abraham made a mess of the situation. But God had already made a promise. And there's something here that I, that I don't want you to miss. I want you to see this. I don't want you to miss it. God is faithful to his word even when we are unfaithful to him. Now let that sink in. God is faithful to his word even when we are unfaithful to him. If God has said it, it will come to pass. He is not like man that he would lie. There is no shadow of turning in him. He keeps his word. He keeps what he says. He does what he's going to do. Even when we wobble and falter in our faith, he has promised. And brothers and sisters, this is good news. Why? Because the very thing we anchor our faith in is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we trust him and believe him. We anchor our faith in John 3, 16, for whosoever, excuse me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God has promised if you believe in Jesus, you will have everlasting life. We bank our lives on trusting the word of the Lord, not trusting the strength of our hands. Because listen, if I could lose my salvation, I would lose it every day that ends in Y. But I can't lose my salvation. Because I didn't save me. Jesus saved me because God said so. And God keeps his word. I'm so thankful that he is faithful to his word even when I am unfaithful. So when you find yourself absolutely blowing it. Fumbling. Falling. Struggling trying with all your might to believe and hold on. Remember this. It is not the strength of your faith that saves you. It is in whom your faith is in. Jesus grabs the weak hand as well as grabs the strong hand, but it is Jesus that grabs us. This is what Abraham forgot. He forgot that God had made a promise, that God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a nation. 
You're going to be a great nation. And anybody that crosses you, I'm going to curse. And Pharaoh fell under that. He crossed him. He got cursed. And then he left. And what did he leave with? He left with camels and gold and silver. And so God turned what Abraham did poorly back to his promise. God took what was broken and made it right. God takes all of our winding road and still keeps his promise. What a wonderful, powerful, beautiful God. And you know why? You know why I believe that so much? You know why I believe I can trust the word of the Lord? Because 2,000 years ago, in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus said, I'm going to go and die and be buried. And I'm going to raise again. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus went and died and was buried and rose again. And they have yet to find his body, so I believe every word. I believe the Lord. So when your faith is wobbling and you can't see past the famine or Egypt and you don't know what to do and you're struggling, remember, God's presence is with you. God's power is greater than anything you face. And more than anything, he is a promise keeper. He will not break his This is our God. This is how good he is. I'm reminded of the saint who was dying. And on his deathbed, he was wrenching in torment because he could not remember any of his favorite Bible verses. He was struggling to recall them. It was calling very much anxiousness in his heart. And a friend, a pastor, came and sat with him. And he said, Pastor, I'm, I'm so worried about my eternity because I can't remember a single verse I learned. The pastor took him by the hand, wiped a tear from his eye, and said, Friend, you may not remember any of them, but God remembers all of them. God is faithful to his word. So you may be here this morning, and you are in one of the hardest seasons of your life, or it may be tomorrow that it shows up. Just remember, before you start scheming and plotting, and certainly don't try to give away your spouse. Remember, God is with you. God is all-powerful. And God keeps his promises. Would you pray with me, Father? Lord, we come before you now and we're thankful that you have done this. God, that every promise in your word is true and right because you are the God of the resurrection. Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us online. It is so great that through technology you were able to join us today. I hope while you got to sing with God's people and hear his word preached, you were moved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Maybe while you were worshiping with us online, the Lord began to prompt your heart. Maybe he's calling you to make some sort of decision or follow him in a more tangible way. Or maybe you just realized you need some help and you want some other people to come along beside you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If that's the case, we want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to tell you that we're a church that's here for you. There are two ways that you can contact us. First, you can click on the link in this post above the video, and you'll find all kinds of ways to hear more about who we are, fill out a contact information, or put in a prayer request. Or if you'd like to, you can email the email that's coming across the screen now, prayer at brushycreek.org. If you send an email to that address, it will get to our staff, and we'll be glad to return it, to pray for you, and to care about you. It is so neat to be able to worship together from all over the world. We would love for you to come join us in person sometime. But until then, we hope to meet you here again next week.